Journeys of Hope. Life is a journey, and this is your spiritual passport. Where will the journey take us today? Let's walk together as we learn to become people of faith and hope. Welcome to Journeys of Hope. I'm Angela Cialana, your guide for today's journey, and I serve as media coordinator for Pilgrim Center of Hope, where we're recording at St. Joseph's Studio. Pilgrim Center of Hope, producer of this weekly radio and podcast program, is a nonprofit ministry founded in 1993 with the mission of guiding people to walk in hope with Christ and the church. Our journey today will be a pilgrimage with Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati to his hometown of Turin, Italy. This young man who passed away in 1925 and is on the path to being declared a saint in the Catholic Church is an encouraging role model for all of us living ordinary lives. On today's journey, you will hear about Pier Giorgio and why he is growing in popularity around the world. Come on an audio pilgrimage to Turin, his hometown, and where he is buried. And we'll learn about how he can teach, encourage, and inspire us today. Joining us is Christine Wohar, founder of Frasati USA, which promotes the spirituality of Pier Giorgio Frasati. Welcome, Christine. Thank you, Angela, and hello to all of your listeners. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to share a little about Blessed Frasati. Wonderful. We're so glad to have you. And uh, let's just start off with a simple introduction, as if you were introducing us to a friend who's here on Earth. So could you tell us about your friend, Pier Giorgio Frasati? Well, that is actually exactly how I like to think of him as my friend, although I know a lot of the saints, maybe we feel a little more distant to or have more of, um, you know, they're higher up than we are. But with Pier Giorgio, it's very easy to think of him as your friend. And, you know, there's a great story about his sister, Luciana. She was asked once if she prayed to her brother for things and she said, why would I pray to him? He's my brother. I just tell him what to do. So <laughs> he had such a comfortable relationship as his sister. I'm not so bold as Luciana Frasati was, but I know that I can ask him things as a friend. So I guess as a simple introduction, I would say Pier Giorgio was alive. He was the embodiment of John 1010, which was the theme of World Youth Day that it was in Denver here in the US when Jesus said he came so that we might have life and have it abundantly. Pier Giorgio strongly believed we should live and not just exist, go through the motions of life. And like St. Paul, he was able to be someone for everyone. So he was an outstanding athlete in a variety of sports. He was a somewhat struggling student. He was a wonderful brother and a son and a friend to so many. He was a young man who loved the Blessed Mother and who, above all, loved the Lord and his faith. He was a daily communicant. He prayed the rosary every day. And he felt an obligation to return the gift he received in Holy Communion every day to the people around him, particularly the less fortunate. Um, he was a practical joker. He was the life of the party. He was holy. He was a 24-7 Catholic guy. He did not compartmentalize his faith to an hour on Sunday. So Pier Giorgio was alive and his enthusiasm for life was contagious. And I think that sums him up, I guess, as simply as I can. Wow, Christine, that's so awesome. Um, you, we, we did talk a lot before this interview, but I tell you what, I didn't tell you that John 10.10 10 is my favorite scripture. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and I hope they put it on my tombstone. So. <laughs> oh, really? Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. Well, another kind of personal connection that I did tell you about is that in 2008, uh, Pier Giorgio Frasati's body was transported to Sydney, Australia to be present right. for World Youth Day. And um, I was blessed to participate in that World Youth Day. Um, go figure, halfway across the world, I was there. Um, and that's where I was first introduced to Pier Giorgio. I was there. I remember being in St. Mary's Cathedral. Uh, they had him there for almost two weeks, and there were these standing banners that illustrated his life, had his quotes um, as we were in line to see his body, to venerate his body. Um, it was in the coffin. It wasn't exposed as far as I remember. But, um, you know, as I was looking at those photos, 
one of the things that really strikes people uh, when they see him, his his picture is that, you know, he he could have been a, a movie star. He had very good looks. He he was very charismatic. You can just tell. Um, so, but what about his life? Was his life glamorous? Was he did he live that movie star lifestyle? <laughs> what can you tell <laughs> us about his background? Um, I'm a little jealous that you had that experience in Australia. I guess I could have gone, but I didn't feel like making that long trip. But I have heard from many people what you've shared about. I've seen the exhibit, not in person, but I was kind of involved with preparing that. And to go through that line and see image after image of him. And there are some really incredible images of Pier Giorgio, thankfully, because the family was into photography and art, which is why we have so many tremendous pictures. But did he live a glamorous life? I guess we have to define glamour and that would affect the answer. I would say he certainly lived a life of privilege. So his father was a very influential man in Italy. His father founded the Italian newspaper La Stampa, which means the press. And at the time there were two newspapers, the morning paper and the evening paper. So La Stampa was the morning paper. It was really the first way people got their news before, you know, smartphones and radio and uh, internet and everything else. So that was where you got your news. So if you were the head of the newspaper, that was big. And his father was big. Um, he also then became a senator. At the time, Italy was a kingdom. So he was the youngest senator in the kingdom of Italy. And that came from his journalistic prowess because he was so influential as uh, a journalist. And then on top of that, he was later appointed ambassador to Germany. And a lot of times in politics, they'll give somebody an ambassadorship because as a political favor, let's say. But this appointment for Mr. Fersati to Germany was very crucial because it came after World War I, which devastated Germany and the Treaty of Versailles, almost more f f further like oppressed, I don't wanna say oppressed Germany, but you know, it was very hard harsh terms. Uh, Pierre Giorgio and his father both thought that Germany was treated rather harshly. And anyway, Mr. Frassati being appointed as ambassador, was a, it was an esteemed appointment, an important appointment. And so this exposed Pierre Giorgio to, you know, living in Berlin at the embassy, at the Italian embassy, even more privileged. And his mother's side of the family had considerable wealth as well. She herself was an accomplished artist. Their home was visited by famous musicians, painters, of course, politicians, and many other people of great affluence. So I guess we would call that glamorous to some extent, right? Because, you know, he was surrounded by these wonderful things and opportunities and people. And now the homes he lived in were very large. If you see pictures of them, they always get oohs and ahs when I give a presentation and show the homes. And the family had maids, they had cooks, they had a butler and a chauffeur. And if you had a chauffeur, it obviously meant you had a very nice car. Um, we didn't mention that Pierre Giorgio was born at the turn of, turn of the 20th century. He was born in 1901. So this was definitely a time when having a car was not a common commodity for most families and certainly not having a chauffeur to drive your car. So because of the social standing of the family and all of those things, um, the opportunities because of his father and his mother's positions, Pierre Giorgio would have had access to the best seats in the house, the best seat at the theater, the best, you know, traveling first class on trains and so on. And, and a well-known story worth repeating, I think, is that he was asked once by a friend, Pierre Giorgio, why do you ride third class? because obviously the friend knew he could ride first class. And Pierre Giorgio answered him, because there is no fourth class. So I think that that kind of tells us, you know, most evidently, did he live a glamorous life? He could have lived a, gl a glamorous life, but he was surrounded by all those worldly things and opportunities, but he was the kind of guy who would have chosen fourth class if it were available. And so I think, like you mentioned about the pictures, we often say that he had everything that would lead you away from a life of holiness and more to pursue the glamorous secular worldly life. It could have been enough for him to have good looks, to have the family wealth and status, to have the world at his fingertips, all of the opportunities for travel. 
but his heart was not in the worldly things. And this was something very difficult for his family to understand. One of the, the things that maybe irked his parents a little was at the ambassador um, home, the, the embassy in, uh, for Italy and Germany, and Senator Frassati as ambassador had to have these big social gatherings, galas and things. But Pietro Giorgio liked to come in at the end and greet the guests as they were leaving. So he felt like he was fulfilling his duty of showing up by kind of showing up at the end and saying goodbye. And then what would he do? He would go and take the flowers off the table and take them to the poor people because he said they needed some joys of life too, like some nice things like flowers rather than just always giving them the necessities to survive like food and clothing. And another thing is that Piotr Giorgio was always known as the guy with the tasche verde, which is an Italian phrase for empty pockets. And, and this was because he was always giving away whatever he had. So he was always broke. Sometimes his friends would have to give the money for him to go on ski trips and things because they knew he was broke. And yet people always knew if you needed something, you could go to Frasati. So, um, you know, Angela, the, there's probably no one around who has not heard of Mother Teresa, right? St. Mother mm -hmm. Teresa of Calcutta. But long before Mother Teresa, there was Pier Giorgio Frassati, a young Italian man, a good looking young Italian man, rather than this old Indian nun who we all have that one iconic image of Mother Teresa in our minds. But there was Pier Giorgio before Mother Teresa with that same all consuming love for the poor. So he's not nearly as well known. And that's just one more reason why I appreciate being able to talk to you about him today. Yeah, well, I think it's so striking that he made those choices uh, to live simply in the midst of the wealth and status that his family had. Um, in the light of the scripture that you mentioned earlier, John 10, 10, that Jesus said, I came, they might have life and have it abundantly. Well, I mean, from a certain point of view, you could say that Pier Giorgio had an abundant life, but it goes to show that what Jesus was talking about and what really fulfills us is something deeper, is something more, um, is what Jesus brings rather than the stuff that could surround us materially. Right. I think too many people see the abundant life as our material possessions. And that's that's the trick, because you're right. Jesus was very clear that you would have life in abundance. While we can be blessed with many things on this earth, as Pierre Giorgio's family was, that's not the true, you know, that's not the end game. That's not the true abundance. That's not where we should be putting our energy and our effort. If we have those things, wonderful. And then we have an obligation to share them, which I think is what Pietro Giorgio really did with those examples that I that I gave you, because that was the essence of his life. The scripture also says, right, it's more blessed to give than receive. So he received a lot, but I think he tried to give as much as he possibly could back. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate the examples that you shared, and I know that there are like a, a million more examples of how he lived simply. <laughs> um, right. So, um, but one thing that I did want to talk about is, um, you know, that he was a normal teenage and young adult person and he had a crush. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if you could just mention that because I, I think sometimes maybe people don't realize that saints and holy people also kind of have those those feelings and those situations too. Yeah, and and, and end up with a broken heart maybe. Right, Pier Giorgio. Um, you know, this is I, this is something I I have a book that's just little uh, reflections, more or less, and I try to explain this in a way that's able to be more accurate than is written about often. Um, so Pier Giorgio was interested in this girl named Laura Hidalgo, and if you read some of the Frasati books, there are different little tidbits of this come out. But I've been able to talk with the family about this. This is something that has been asked of me a lot and that I tried to talk about enough with them to finally like to fill in all of like, the questions and the blanks. So he had because because actually, if you read Pier Giorgio's letters, there's another girl that he writes to that you really get a sense that he was really attracted to. But Laura is the one that we know of. 100% because she was Italian. The other one was not an Italian in his close circle of friends. Laura was a few years older than Pietro Giorgio, and she was um, orphaned 
in her teens. So their parents passed away and she had a younger brother and she was helping to raise that brother. And she was a few, about three years older than Piero Giorgio. And he, she was in the Catholic women's group and he was in the Catholic men's group and their paths crossed in the school that they went to. And I was just talking to one of my brothers about this, who I was a senior, he was in eighth grade. And I said, I feel like you're always so much younger than me when really you're not just because we didn't cross paths in school. And it's funny because Piero Giorgio had these opportunities with Laura and would see her and he started to develop a real strong a attachment to her. But in those days, courtship was important. And so uh, you were gentlemanly and it wasn't the way the culture is today. So if he showed some favor to Laura, he also did it with Tina and his other women friends. If he brought back flowers from the mountains, he brought them back for them all. But he recognized he was developing this, uh, you know, real strong feeling for her. In the end, Piero Giorgio chose not to pursue that relationship, and it's often misunderstood and said that it was because his parents didn't approve. It's true that they probably would not have loved that choice because she was not from the same social status. And like I said, she was a few years older. She didn't have, you know, come from a wealthy family background or anything. But the parents never really were aware of this feeling that Piero Giorgio had. Um, and so people often say it was the mother didn't approve, but that's not really what it was. It was that Pierre Giorgio's parents were on the verge of separation. They had a bad marriage, an unhappy marriage, let's say. And he knew that that could be the last straw in their relationship to introduce now one more thing to argue about, this girl of Pierre Giorgio that he chose. And so he said, what good would it be to build one and, you know, if it build one new relationship, um, put, you know, put the foundation on the ruins of another. So rather than pursue that relationship with Laura, he chose not to. But it was his choice. Um, he And he writes about he writes letters that you can really see the pain that it caused him and how he was really trying. It was a real crisis for him. And um, he was trying to overcome that feeling. But it wasn't that he was ever told not to do it. And he writes very beautifully. And he says, he asks his friend for prayers for him and also for her that she would achieve the goals that God had for her and that he could transcend that love for her to a greater love. And that, that's what he chose to do. Um, and so, yeah, it was a, it's another example, another point of relatability with him that, uh, you know, you fall in love. You can still be a saint. You have a broken heart. You can be a saint. And there are saintly ways to pursue re relationships as well and that he was willing to sacrifice his potential love for the greater love that he had for his parents and his his desire for them to stay together and you know rebuild their relationship it's a little controversial sometimes to talk about because we live in a culture where you know we're just all about ourselves and making ourselves happy and a lot of people would have said i don't care what my parents think <laughs> you know i want to be with that person i'm going to be with them and it was not the way that he lived his life even in that pursuit of that relationship Hmm, that's really beautiful to think about how his intention was so clear and so strong. Um, and he also, you know, as you're speaking about his letters and things, it seems like, to me at least, he really had kind of a way with words that he was a little bit of a, you know, poetic almost or poetic soul. Um, and at the same time, very relatable. Um, like you mentioned earlier, he was a sportsman. Um, he loved the outdoors. And so um, I know that a lot of folks that know of Pier Giorgio Frassati, they've heard this phrase um, associated with him often, which in Italian is verso l'alto. And that could be translated from my understanding as upward or to the top. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this phrase and maybe what it means for folks and why why they use it so much. And then also, do we know what it meant for, for Pier Giorgio? Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up, particularly because it's true that that phrase, verso l'alto, it's, it's closely associated with him. But a lot of times I will hear people say it was his motto. And I don't think that that was ever his motto. In fact, I've never seen it used ever. Like he he would write these letters. We have a book of his letters. And he would write a lot of things repeatedly. He would use a lot of phrases over and over again. But I've never seen a letter where he ever used that expression. 
but he it became famous because um, he Pierre Giorgio was a collector, and one of his collections was photo albums. And like I said before, we have beautiful photos of him because his mother was an artist, the family was into photography, he had scrapbooks, he had photo albums, and he was um, he would always write a caption on the back of the photo and he would date it where it was from. So he was very organized. And I agree with you about his writings. I think Pierre Giorgio was a great writer. Remember, his father was a journalist and I think it came to him a little bit naturally. And if you read his letters, you really see a progression through those letters from a child to an adult and some beautiful thoughts, which I always like to tell people, remember when you read them, this was a guy who was 20, 21, 22. They're beautiful, beautifully written things. So he liked to collect, he, he organized his photos and he wrote these captions, sometimes humorous and sometimes just reflective. And on the back of a classic, very famous photo of him climbing a mountain, he wrote those words, verso alto. Uh, it's a prayer card that's available in a poster and you'll see it often. He's kind of looking upward, reaching for that next rock on a rock face. And so he chose that description of what he was looking at of himself. And, and that became like associated with him. It's definitely associated with people who have a devotion to Piero Giorgio because it became a reminder to us and a challenge to us to follow him to the heights of holiness. And it was so significant because that was the last time he ever climbed a mountain, although he didn't know that would be the last time. He died unexpectedly a month later. So the fact that he got that picture, it was developed, he wrote that on the back and he comments on, you know, on that the difficulty of that and the look on his, you can't really see his face, but the you see the angle of his head and you know that he's looking upward and that he he wrote verso alto to the top. I don't think he really, I think he probably did mean what we think it means, like looking up to the heights, to God, to the top. And a challenge for us to not settle for mediocrity, but to strive for the heights of holiness the way he did. There's a, an absolutely brand new docudrama that's been produced by EWTN, and it's called To the Top, Pier Giorgio Frassati, which um, just is a beautiful short docudrama showing uh, a mountain climb with his friends. Basically, it's, it's the extent of the whole docudrama is this climb in the Italian Alps and um, just something that keeps that in your mind of going to the top. But it wasn't really a phrase that he went around saying to his friends, you know, but it's a good phrase for us to look toward him to lead us to the top, verso l'alto. Thanks for that explanation. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left in this segment, but I I want to mention that I believe there is a phrase that he did like um, that he used, which was vivere non vivacchiare, to live, not to exist. Um, and I just wanted to hear your thoughts on why that was special to him. Yeah, this I could talk about for 20 minutes, actually. <laughs> vivere non vivacchiare, we really should, I should have spent more time on, but that was a phrase of Pier Giorgio. It's from a famous uh, quote, one, probably one of the most well-known quotes of his, where he said, to live without the faith, without a patrimony to defend, without a steady struggle for the truth is not living but existing, and we should never just exist but live. And that gets back to the John 10.10 10, aspect of his life to live and have an abundance life and you know saint Irenaeus said the glory of god is man fully alive and that's Pierre Giorgio's spirituality to be fully alive he had so many ways where he could have just chosen the easy course but he never did he really was living his life so even though it was a short life every aspect of his life what and that was based on his catholic faith because the rest of that letter says how he says in the beginning of that letter, how monotonous and boring my life is, which I find crazy. You know, how could he say <laughs> life was monotonous? And then he says, but then I realize how lucky I am to have the faith. And then he says, and because we have the faith to live without, it would be in existence. So his cure for boredom, which we all have so many people today that have no idea what to do with themselves. His cure for boredom was your faith. And that with your faith, you could live, fully live and not just have a mere existence. And I think that particular expression, even Pope Francis has used that expression on occasion, vivere non vivacchiare, in reference to Pietro Giorgio. That is really, um, I think, the summation of his spirituality, to live and not exist. Well, it, it really seems to come out of his relationship with God. 
um, his, his close relationship with God and also his close relationship with other people, especially the poor, whom it sounds like he really found God in the poor. Um, and I know we could talk about that forever and ever. Um, but, you know, I, I what I'm really appreciating, Christine, from what you're sharing with us is just this portrait of a person who it is just jumping out of the the speakers or the, you know, whatever you're listening to this, this discussion on, um, someone who, uh, I think is very, we keep saying relatable, but more than that, someone who's inspiring. Right. You know? Yeah. He challenges uh, me. I have to say, I have a lot of just certain devotions and things. And the thing that we can talk more about, um, after is, he, he takes away all your excuses. I say it all the time. He takes away my excuses because I can look at certain saints like Mother Teresa and say, I'll never do that. I'll never be that. But I look at Pierre Giorgio and say, what's my excuse for not doing that? Why can't I? And he could do it. Why can't I? I mean, he was able to do all of these things, live in the world. I should be able to, too. And so I think it's a real inspiration to have somebody that you can look at who gets it, who did what we did, walk where how we walk. And then shows that there's something more and we have to respond to that like you just can't ignore it there you know we can we can do it we can be better we can we can live and not just you know pass the time the hours of our day because he did we know we can and it sometimes that's all you need is one good example amen so the inspiration yeah. is definitely i think it definitely a word that yeah relatable and inspiring absolutely well, friends, you're listening to Journeys of Hope. I'm Angela Cialana here with Christine Wohar, who is the founder of Frasati USA. And Frasati USA promotes the spirituality of blessed Pier Giorgio Frasati. That's who we've been talking about. Uh, we appreciate you listening to Journeys of Hope. And if you are just eating this up, well, guess what? Good news. We have more after the break. We're going to continue our journey and learn about the impact of this beautiful role model, this inspiring role model, and what he can teach us today. You're on the everyday journey of life, and sometimes it's tough to keep hope alive. Well, that's why Pilgrim Center of Hope is here for you. Not only does Pilgrim Center of Hope provide you programs like Journeys of Hope, but did you know you can also find other helpful media productions from Pilgrim Center of Hope on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Every first Friday, take an audio retreat with Jesus called Meet the Master. Every third Thursday, have a social with the saints. And our new quarterly series, Who is the Man of the Shroud, meets at the intersection of faith, true crime, science and medicine, history, art, and much more. Find it all at pilgrimcenterofhope.org or on your favorite podcast app. And keep hope alive in your daily journey. Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Hello, this is Jason Nunez and Angela Cialana, both from the media department at Pilgrim Center of Hope, who produce Journeys of Hope. Would you like to honor someone special in your life and support the production of this unique weekly series? We are in need of monthly sponsors for upcoming Journeys of Hope programs to help cover some of the production costs by a donation. If you've sponsored a month of Journeys of Hope in the past, we thank you for your support. Pilgrim Center of Hope has a donation wish list, and on it, several months of upcoming Journeys of Hope programming are still needing sponsors. If you're interested, please consider selecting a month that you wish to sponsor by going to Pilgrim Center of Hope org and under the give menu select wish list you can also choose to dedicate your donation in honor or in memory of someone special thank you for joining us in our mission now enjoy the rest of your journey welcome back to journeys of hope our journey today is a spiritual pilgrimage with blessed pier giorgio frassati to his hometown of turin italy and joining us on the way is christine wohar founder of Frasati USA, which promotes the spirituality of Pier Giorgio Frasati, who died in 1925 and is on the path to sainthood in the Catholic Church. So, Christine, you've also co-edited the book Pier Giorgio Frasati, Letters to His Friends and Family, and you've authored the book Finding Frasati and Following His Path to Holiness. So I'm really curious how you came to be able to spend time with some of the Frasati family members and what you learned from them. 
so you know that expression, God writes straight with crooked lines. Um, <laughs> uh, Bishop Egan from England, who wrote the foreword for my book, he, he says at the beginning, we don't choose the saints, the saints choose us. So uh, this is definitely a case of that. I, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee to go to law school in 1995. That was my plan. And God's plan was fast at work on this Frasati part of life that I never anticipated because on the very first day that I arrived in Nashville, I met a priest who really be, you know, changed the trajectory of my life. I did go to law school and pass the bar and you know, began practicing in Nashville. But I also had this thread of Pierre Giorgio that was running through my life from the very beginning. Father asked me to start a young adult group. And he came up with this idea of calling it the Frasati Society and Pierre Giorgio would be our patron. And we do claim it was the very first one, although some other groups disagree, but um, the lawyer in me says we were first. <laughs> um, anyway, that was my introduction to Pierre Giorgio. And I should add that I am actually Byzantine Catholic. And so devoting my life to promoting a Roman Catholic saint was certainly never in my plan. <laughs> but there goes God and, and his plans. So some years after starting that group at, at the church, at the parish I belong to, I started a second group at a Catholic college here in Nashville. And then I was going to Rome to visit a friend and she knew of this Prasadi devotion. And so she arranged a meeting with Pierre Giorgio's niece, Wanda Gavranska, who lives in Rome. And that was really how it all began. After that uh, trip to Rome, it was like Holy Week that year. I came back to the United States and I resigned my position. And I began uh, this idea of going back to Italy and working with Wanda and just seeing how I could help spread that message. So um, it was a real leap of faith, but I really felt strongly. And a good friend of mine said, you know, you can always practice law. How often can you be involved in you know, something like this? So um, that's what I did. And when I left the country to go back, um, I arrived in Italy two days before Pierre Giorgio's younger sister's birthday. So I was actually able to celebrate the 104th birthday of Luciana Frassati. Wow. Uh, so I cannot, I can't really describe for you how awesome that was. I mean, so Pierre Giorgio only lived to be 24 years old. His sister lived to be 105. And there I am, an American, just getting off the plane and getting over jet lag and having ice cream cake on the veranda with Luciana. <laughs> and her family. I mean, really, who can make these things up, right? Yeah. Luciana, coincidentally, was born and died in the very same home, although she had other homes where she lived in. Um, that was really something interesting. So I became very blessed to have these types of extended stays and get to know all of Luciana. had six children, five are still alive today. Uh, I was also there at the family home during the last month of her life and was able to be there for her funeral in 2007. And you know, those are just things that God arranges. And uh, there's no explanation other than by naively saying yes to doing this, he opened the doors for me to have these tremendous experiences. And, and one thing I like to say that I think people should reflect on from the family. In this family, there was a, a young man who died at the age of 24, Pierre Giorgio. His sister lived to be 105. And many people don't know, but the Frasati's first child was a girl named Elda who died in infancy at eight months old before Pier Georgia. So she was first then Pier Georgia. So in one family, you have a someone who lived eight months as a, you know, a an infant, someone who lived 24 years and someone who lived 105. And really, we have no guarantee how long our life will be. And so we need to follow the example of Pier Giorgio and choose to live for Christ now. And that's the challenge of him, right? To live and not exist. Really look and ask ourselves, am I living today? Am I just existing? Stop living, um, stop existing as just secular worldly beings and really start striving for the things that really matter. You know, that verso l'alto and vivere non vivicare, you know, are really good um, ca calls and challenges to us. And when I just look at the family itself and see you know, we, we have no guarantees. It's it's just crazy to think that he had a sister that lived to be 105. And sometimes I'm like, Lord, did you let her live that long just so I could have these opportunities with her? Mm. I, I know that's not why, but it's like she had to live an incredibly long life for our paths to cross. And it's a beautiful thing. Those are it's mem There are many men memories like that, that, you know, that I just, I will treasure always. Wow. 
Well, um, we at Pilgrim Center of Hope, we're, we're called Pilgrim Center of Hope because we believe in the power of seeing your life as a pilgrimage to heaven. And, you know, as you were saying, no matter how old or young you may be at the time of your physical death, that ultimately it is seeing our life as that pilgrimage, living every single day like Pier Giorgio did. And it sounds like maybe like his sister did too, um, so beautifully. Uh, one of the things that I was struck by is I visited the website of Frasati USA, the organization that you founded. Um, you all have a section about visiting Italy on pilgrimage with Pier Giorgio in mind. And with this program being, um, of course, a reminder about our daily pilgrimage, but also uh, learning about pilgrimages to various beautiful destinations like Pier Giorgio's hometown. I'd love for you to share a little bit about um, some of the notes that you have and maybe some of the things that you've learned along the way in, in visiting these places on pilgrimage with Pier Giorgio um, at the forefront. Sure, I have to have to say, I'm, I know that that section of the website needs updated and I've been being pressured a little bit by some people who are actually working on that right now, but it, it is, it started because people ask me all the time, I'm going to Italy and I'd like to see something and I'm repeating all of these things. So I thought, well, we'll try to do that as much as I can. And I have so many pictures that are not on there and so many things that, that need added, but you can go on and see the main highlights of the places important to Pier Giorgio. In fact, if people who have ever been to Turin to see the Shroud of Turin will have walked right past his, his uh, altar. Pier Giorgio is the only saint in the Cathedral of Turin, the Duomo there, and he's on the same side as the Shroud, so you actually have to walk past him to go to the end of that, um, you know, side, side area there to get to the Holy Shroud. Um, Pier Giorgio's body, as you mentioned at World Youth Day, he, he, about World Youth Day, it is in, perfectly incorrupt, but he has never been on display. And at that altar area, you will see a portrait of him and a, perhaps a banner of him in black and white. But it's confusing because there's a floral image below the altar area, which was actually painted by his mother, who was an artist. And so you, I walked past it myself the first time and went to another church thinking I was at the wrong place. But um, so that would be one thing to pray at his tomb in the Cathedral of Turin, uh, where his incorrupt body lies in repose. And then uh, Pier Giorgio was from Turin, and there are many, many places that you can go to. La Consolata is a beautiful basilica, which most of the people from Turin consider the real heart of the, you know, their churches there, rather than the cathedral. The cathedral is not the most attractive, but the um, La Consolata basilica is spectacular. And Pier Giorgio would go there, for he he was a member of St. Vincent de Paul to serve the poor, and he would tell people, Meet me at six o'clock beneath the consolata clock. So he would always go to the consolata. They and that's a basilica in Italy right now where there's mass like all day long. It's not one of the ones that closes for several hours. Um, it's a beautiful place to go, and it's it was special to him. There's also the family home. Pier Giorgio lived in a home that was destroyed destroyed in the war. It's not there. Uh, and then there was um, another building where they lived for a certain period of time. And then there's a great big. Uh, building which was the family home from about when he was 12 on and it's now a bank and I have a picture of that on the website and that church is where that home is where he died and across from that home is the church where his funeral was held La Crocetta these the, the Italians have all of these fun nicknames for things if you're looking for a church and you ask for it by name you're in trouble because <laughs> call it something that it's not like the Canjo church and it's not it's Saints Fabian and, and uh, Damien or uh, Fa Fabio and Saints Fabian and Sebastian, they call Kanjo Church, and it throws you when when uh, you're trying to figure out things. And there's the Church of St. Dominic, a very ancient, um, beautiful old Dominican church where he took his vows as a lay Dominican. There are a lot of places to see there related to the Frasati family, the newspaper office, and so on. So those are some of the highlights. And then I always tell people, if you have time and if you have a car, and if you really love Pier Giorgio, the best thing to do is to go to Polone. And it's it's hard to describe, but like you have Milan and Turin, and then kind of at the tip of the triangle would be Polone up there at the base of the mountains. It's a little village. Um, and the main street is called Pier Giorgio Frassati Street and intersects with Senator Alfredo Frassati Street. 
and the family home is there and it's not a museum and it's not something you pay fees to go. It's still their home, but they'll let people go. And so if you happen to go there and ring the buzzer outside, whether the family is there or not, they're usually there in summer months because it's cold up there in the mountains in the winter. Um, there's a caretaker there year round and they'll let you, if you can stumble with your English and say for Saudi, they'll let you in to see those rooms where Pietro Giorgio lived. The room where he died in Turin has been transferred to the home, the family home in Polone. So the bed where he died is there and you can kneel and pray at the bed where he died. And they have a lot of his belongings there. And unlike, like if you've been to see Padre Pio, everything is kind of behind plexiglass. The family, it's their home. And so it's not like that. And it's a very unusual, unique experience, I think, to just be able to go into the home um, and see things. So that's, that's, you know, really a highlight, but it's not easy to get to by train or by bus. You can, but it's not easy. And then from there, you have to, you have a few parish churches that were important to Pier Giorgio, the Kanjo Church, the cemetery where his sister and all of his family are, and where he was buried until he was beatified, and then his body was moved. Pope John Paul came to the tomb and prayed there in Polone, and he, he did an, um, a special speech from Polone and then and then there is the mountain church in Europa which is even more difficult because it's one of the windiest curviest roads I've ever been on ever and Piero Giorgio would go up there and that was his most favorite beloved Madonna the Madonna of Europa a brown Madonna um, that is in this old church there's an old church and a new church and people always go to the new church because it looks more spectacular with the dome but the old church, which kind of looks like the Alamo, is where he would go to pray to his beloved Madonna. And then from there, you can climb his mountains, Mount Macrone, where the family often climbed. Um, so there's there's so many things to do and see. It's, you have to work a little bit to get there. And it's difficult because when, we, um, when people want to do pilgrimages to Italy, for people who haven't been, they always usually want to go to Rome. And, you know, Italy is that long, uh, you know, narrow from north to south type country. So... It's hard to do Rome and do all of these Pier Giorgio things unless you add a few extra days to get there. But it's well, it's well worth it. It's inspiring. You have like a total immersion experience. Um, you know, for me to walk, to climb the, the to, to go on the staircase in the family home and put my hand on the banister and know that he did it all the time, that he walked where I walked, everywhere you go, Pier Giorgio was. It's it's an exciting, um, exceptional experience, I think, to to travel in person. And so the website doesn't do that kind of justice to it, but it does give you an idea of what is there available to go and do and see. Well, what a privilege for us to be able to listen to you as you're just bringing these places to life. Thank, thank you so much for, for doing that for us. And um, you really just helped us to understand Pier Giorgio Farsati um, in, in a new light, I think, um, as we've been discussing here. Um, I'd be really curious to kind of pick your brain about some of the ways that you think he has made an impact on the world in in his time while he was alive, but then also even today. Well, uh, one thing we can say about how he made an impact during his lifetime, when Pietro Giorgio died, so he died at the age of 24, they believe he contracted polio from his service to the poor because he would go into the worst places, the, you know, the dirtiest streets, the hospitals that had lepers and things like that. So he got polio and he died within a week, suddenly, unexpectedly, and thousands of people poured out into the streets for his funeral. And that was really what we would say the beginning of his canonization cause, much like John Paul II when they were out in the piazza saying Santo Subito, because that was where the outpouring happened and this all began. And his father, seeing that crowd, said to his mother, we did not know our son because this is when the family started to realize oh, how did all of these people know him? And it's really something worth contemplating, I think, because as I said before, he didn't have social media, podcasts, radio programs like this. He had no outreach through media, really. It was just his love that reached thousands, thousands of people. One guy, 24 year old guy, by the time he died, had reached these thousands of people. So we can all do better and make a difference uh, in that way by touching the people right around us, because that's what Pier Giorgio did then. Um, that's how he chose to live his faith and look at the impact that he had. People started naming their children Pier Giorgio and that canonization cause moved forward. Atheists wrote beautiful articles about the impact that he had. 
Um, his legacy was, it just, ha it just, um, it was so tangible after his death, the, you know, the impact that he had on the community and to realize that how many of those people he was reaching on his own with the means that he had at his disposal. Today, I would say it's very easy to see the impact that he's having because um, he is so relatable and because we're talking about him. I mean, to think that the choices that Pierre Giorgio made every day when he got up and out of bed every morning, I think about this a lot, like he's controlling me, he's controlling my life because of the way he lived his. So here <laughs> I am doing this because of how, he, and if he didn't do that, I wouldn't be doing this. So I think that he's been a, a tremendous model for people both lay and religious. There are many religious people who take, there are many sister Frasadis and father Frasadis. It's it's always enjoyable to me when I get news of a new, a new uh, person with their religious name. But I would say, and I'm always fascinated by the religious because I always feel like he's more for the lay people, but um, they remind me they're striving to live their vocation just as we are. So if you are striving to stay Catholic in this culture, it's trying, trying to detach from the allure of the world, follow what's the narrow path to holiness and getting more and more narrower every day. We have so many fantastic saintly examples in the church, but we don't have as many that come to mind to me as readily as someone like Peter Giorgio, who really faced what we face. I mean, his parents were on the verge of separation. His parents had very little spirituality. His mother, like I said, was like a Sunday Catholic. His father often called an atheist, but really just a fallen away Catholic. Some people will say agnostic or he was a typical fallen away Catholic. They weren't praying the rosary together in the family home. They thought he was going to be a blockhead or wasting his time. They didn't understand him. He loved his friends. He loved sports. He loved the mountains. He liked to joke around and he could do all of those things, all of those normal things, be a student and struggle. You know, Peter Giorgio was six years into his college degree and still hadn't finished Mm -hmm. um, he hadn't graduated yet at the time of his death because not because he wasn't intelligent, but because he spent so much time in service to the poor. So in all of that, all of the things he was doing, all of the ways he was living, he was always striving for the, the higher to the top, something more. He knew there was something more. It didn't deter him what his family thought. He saw Christ in everyone. He wanted that heavenly homeland. He wrote about it. He um, could look at himself and reflect on his own shortcomings, and he could show us the way to sanct sanctity, I think, in a way that, like I said, some other saints make it seem unattainable. Sometimes we look at the lives of the saints and we'll I'll never be like that. But Pierre Giorgio shows us we can be like that, and that relatability is what gets um, discussed with me the most among people that like to share their love of Pierre Giorgio with me because you can find something in him to relate to. And then that can take you to the next level of striving with him as your friend, as your guide up the mountain of holiness. So I, right. I think his impact is, is considerable and is definitely growing because as the culture changes so much and becomes more and more anti-Christian, uh, you know, and we, we have to really fight um, to live in this in this culture and to live as Catholics and live fully alive. We have somebody who's he lived in a time very similar to this, actually, even though it was almost 100 years ago. And so he really is a tremendous guide, I think, a tremendous companion, which gets back to your very first um, identification of him as a friend. We need friends like this. And if we don't have him on Earth, we certainly need them in heaven. And he kind of crosses that void so readily and becomes so uh, real to you. I'm very blessed. I have this beautiful portrait here in my um, stairway that I can look at that was something done by his mother, actually, and they made many reproductions of it, and I have one. And I just pass it every day, and I, I can say to him, you know, help me today. You know, you understand. You get it. You understand. And I just see him as somebody, like if it was my brother or sister, I'm walking past to say, hey, this is what's going on today. Can you give me a hand? And, and I, that's the beauty of Pierre Giorgio to me is that he gets it. Yeah. He, gets it, he got it then and he gets it now. When he died, his friends missed him so much because that void of somebody who like he led them on, as you said, he inspired them. He, he, you, you need somebody in sports. We have heroes in the movies. We have heroes, but we don't have heroes like this who really show us how to live 
for what really matters. And the beauty of it is, like I said, he was 24 years old when he died. At 24, I wasn't doing what he was doing. I'm not doing it now, but he was. And, and so we can and we can do better and we should do better. And the, the good news of that is that God gives us that grace, that it's not something we have to kind of like pull out of ourselves, of our own nature. But, you know, Pier Giorgio, he loved the Blessed Sacrament. He loved Jesus. He was close to Jesus, as we've been saying. And today in the United States, the bishops are calling for Eucharistic revival. And I would like to know, because you know so much about Pier Giorgio in terms of all these experiences you've had, and it seems like he really has asked you to sort of represent him for at least us who are English speaking anyway. Um, you know, what if he was here on earth and we asked him about this Eucharistic revival? Like what advice would he give us, do you think, about pursuing that revival? Well, we don't even have to guess, Angela. We, we don't even have to speculate what he would say because um, there's a letter that he wrote and it's on the back. An excerpt of that is on the back of a prayer card that we have. We call it our Eucharistic meditation. And it's also a very famous um, quote attributed to him. And he says, I urge you with all the strength of my soul. Remember, this was he was 22 years old now when he wrote this. He was giving a speech to Catholic youth. He said, I urge you with all the strength of my soul to approach the Eucharistic table as often as possible. Feed on this bread of angels. Feed on this bread of angels where, from which you will draw the strength to fight inner struggles, the struggles against all passions and against all adversities. He goes on from there. Um, Pier Giorgio, when he was a boy, that was when the church changed the age for receiving First Holy Communion. So he would not have been able to receive communion until he was about 12. When he was 9 or 10 is when that happened, that the change was made. And so... Uh, he went to this Jesuit school because he failed Latin and he was sent to the school. Um, it was an embarrassment and a disgrace and a shame for him, but it was the trajectory of his spiritual life because he was there just for that one year. And the fathers there, the Jesuit fathers recognized something special and encouraged him to go to daily communion. And he asked his mother, she told him no. And people say she was against the church. She said no, because she didn't want it to be common. And one day he knocks at the rector's door and he's excited and he's saying in Italian, I won, o vinto, o vinto, father, I won. And father plays dumb and says, what did you win, uh, Pier Giorgio, the lottery or something? He says, I won permission to go to communion every day. Now, I mean, think about it, 12 year old, oh, he was, he was, that was all he, he, 12 years old could see the value of the Eucharist. Some people go every day and like myself, I'm very, some big can be very nonchalant about it. It can become the habit that his mother didn't want it to become. And some people barely can drag themselves on Sunday and miss the greatest thing that we can ever experience as alive that the angels are envy of us because they can't have. So I know that Pierre Giorgio would say, with all the strength of his soul, he urges us to go to communion properly prepared, which he would do as often as you can. No question about it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I know that Pier Giorgio will continue to, to teach us, um, all of us listening, um, you, I'm sure, uh, as he's continuing to teach you and be active in your life. And I'm just so grateful for this time, Christine. Um, we Every week we give people a jewel for the journey um, to reflect right. on throughout the week. And we want to reflect this week on some words of Pier Giorgio Frassati. And this quote is so beautiful. It really tells us about who he was. He said, the purpose for which we have been created shows us the path. Even if strewn with many thorns, it is not a sad path. It is joyful even in the face of sorrow. And so I just want to encourage all of you who are listening, um, if you're feeling those thorns, to um, ask for the intercession of Pier Giorgio Frassati, um, to see the joy in the midst of your path. And as we close this time together, I'd like to pray together the glory be because I feel like Pier Giorgio wanted to give God glory in all that he did. Oh, wow. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed Christ Georgia. Pray for us. Well, Christine, thank you so much for joining us. I know that everyone is very curious how they can read your books and learn more about Blessed Pure Giorgio Farsati. So how can people get in contact with you at Farsati USA? Well, the easiest thing is to visit the website, Farsati USA, all one word, dot org. And from there, you can get to everything, Farsati USA dot org. Thank you. We will definitely link that on our website as well. Fellow pilgrims, we invite you to come visit Pilgrim Center of Hope and learn more about our threefold ministry of pilgrimages, conferences, and media production outreach. We are a nonprofit ministry and join us in this vital mission of evangelization as we guide people to Christ in the church. You can learn more at pilgrimcenterofhope.org or by calling us at 210-521-3377. Fellow pilgrims, let's strive to live each day with love, faith, courage, and hope. Until next time, may God bless you and safe travels. Mm -hmm.